All right, welcome. Uh, I'm John Schwartz. I'm the Dean of the College of Public Service. Uh, it's my pleasure to welcome you to this really important Vital Voices. Uh, tell you a little bit about the College of Public Service. I know a number of you are students here or faculty here. Uh, we are at University of Houston downtown. We're the second largest university in Houston. And we're the most diverse, not just in Texas, but in the Southern region. And in our college, we focus on social work, criminal justice, and education. And we think a lot about how to reform the systems that we work within. Uh, so this, to me, is a very important Vital Voices. Uh, we know this is a huge problem. We know this is a huge problem, especially in Houston. This is also a unique Vital Voices because this is the first Vital Voices that's a three-day event and is organized primarily by a student in our college. So I'm very proud to have her in our college. Uh, over there, Rhonda Kirkendall is the one who organized this and brought us together to talk about this important topic. I also want to mention Stephen Villano, who's the director of our center, uh, who is uh, responsible for vital voices in our college. So thank you very much for being here. I'm really excited to hear this presentation. And Rhonda, thank you. Good evening, UHD. We are so excited to be able to put on for you sex traffic in, in Houston, hidden in plain sight. So why do we say hidden in plain sight? For everybody that's in attendance tonight and everybody that is attending virtually, when you go about the next time your daily routine and your errands, when you go to the grocery store, when you go to the post office, when you go to the nail salon, there are victims of sex trafficking hidden in plain sight. And so it's our job to be aware. So today is day one. So today we're gonna to be covering what is sex trafficking so you can be able to identify it and know where to report. And at the end of this presentation, we're gonna have a questions and answer section with all of the speakers. There are white cards over here. As you're listening to the presentation, if you have a question, just raise your hand a little bit. They'll bring you a card, bring you a pen, jot down your question. At the end of the presentation, we're going to be uh, having a Q&A. Our Q&A is mainly gonna be focused on myths and facts about sex trafficking. So we know that this is a difficult subject. We know that we are gonna be talking about sex trafficking, sexual exploitation, and violence. If at any time you feel uncomfortable, whether you are here in person or virtually, take a break, walk out, get a drink of water, walk to the restroom, just uh, feel free to leave as needed. So I have the pleasure of introducing you to Krista Mayfield. Krista Mayfield works with Unbound Now Houston. They are an international organization whose mission is to end sex trafficking. One of their greatest strengths is their education and awareness, and that is exactly what Krista works on. And so welcome, Krista. Thank you, Rhonda, and thank you, UHD. I'm very honored to be here and excited to unpack this issue in a way that I hope makes it more tangible. I want us to walk away from the, these next three days really understanding what exploitation looks like in our city and how we all interact and interface with the people that are experiencing this kind of abuse. So I have the um, lofty job of trying to lay the foundation. What is human trafficking? So as we move forward in these next three days, you guys have a really concrete understanding of what this issue really is and what it looks like. So the law was written in the year 2000. Making human trafficking a crime happened uh, like 22 years ago. We only have language we've only had language the last 22 years to encompass a situation and a reality that has existed pretty much since the dawn of time. And so what we're doing now is we're going back and looking at things that society we've said, oh, that's just a bad situation or, oh, that's just normal. And now we're reframing it. And so there is a lot of background work. And when we ask the question, well, why is human trafficking such a hot button issue? I think on, on one hand, it's because we're having to reframe literally centuries of injustices, centuries of exploitation, cultures that are defined by this, communities that have been rooted in this types of situation. And now we're going, oh, we have words for this and now we can collectively agree this is not okay. 
So this law kind of breaks down the definition of human trafficking. As you can see, it's kind of lengthy, so I'm going to break it down in a little bit more of an understandable way. But first, I want to talk about human trafficking in the context of abuse. When we hear the words human trafficking, it does evoke something in us, right? Part of the reason that it's a hot button word, I would say the other half of that scenario, is that it's kind of, we, we don't really have words for anything that seems bigger than this. And because of that, human trafficking can kind of tend to be this very isolated issue. We talk about it in a very separate manner. But human trafficking is a form of abuse. It happens in the context of abuse. But it's an abuse with an, a, a layer, abuse with a purpose. I'm not just being abusive to be controlling or be mean. I'm not just being abusive because I have an anger problem. My abuse is now pushing me and pushing this other person into some sort of financial, commercial, profitable gain. It's abuse with a purpose, and that purpose is profit or gain of some kind. And so we have this combination of mistreating someone and then using them for my own benefit. And that together forms this story of human trafficking. And it is a story. It's unlike most other crimes. It happens over a period of time. It doesn't happen just in a moment. And so you can't just open up one page of someone's story and say they have been trafficked. You sometimes have to look back years and say, oh, they met this person, and then this person did this, and then this thing happened. And so that's kind of what I'm going to unpack today is how that story plays out. But I think it's really important to understand that human trafficking is just kind of the last stop that we have language for on a long train of bad situations. An unhealthy relationship, an abusive relationship, relationship where someone's taking advantage of somebody and then there's human trafficking and it's not that abuse is not as bad it's just this layer of purpose that we're adding to kind of formulate that story and it's very important that we see human trafficking in that bigger picture of abuse and unhealthy relationships and situations so when the law breaks down what human trafficking is it's looking for a handful of things one if we're going to decide if someone is guilty of human trafficking, have you trafficked a person? To traffic somebody means that you utilize control methods, and the law kind of breaks those down into categories, force, fraud, and coercion. Those are the control methods. To induce someone to perform a work or a service or to engage in commercial sex. I'll say that one more time. So human trafficking can kind of generally be defined as the use of force, fraud, or coercion, to induce somebody to perform a work or a service or to engage in commercial sex. Now, if we think about this life of exploitation and the, the practical realities of somebody being used or sold in this way, there are some actions that are involved in that scenario. Things have to be done in order for that to take place. And so what you see in these actions are things that are done in the world of people being commercialized and people being used in that way. And so recruiting just means getting someone into this life. That could be introducing someone to the person who will eventually sell them or exploit them. That might be selling them this grand lifestyle that sounds really awesome. The recruiting part of that story is the on-ramp to this lifestyle, to this situation. And there's harboring. So if someone is, is kept in a home, a car, for the purpose of continuing their exploitation. Again, you're thinking about it um, in, in a hard way, right? In, in, in the same way that we kind of understand other forms of selling things, right? There's things have to be done in order for things to be used and sold. And the same sort of things can apply to these situations when we're looking at trafficking. So these people are m might be kept in some place, um, but we're gonna talk about why that's not that storage unit or that a storage container, shipping container idea is not necessarily, almost always, never how it happens. But that can be an element. Transporting, whether that's across the country to another country, down the street. If someone is moved for the purpose of trafficking, then that person can be convicted of trafficking. Providing and obtaining just means buying and selling a person, advertising for a person, asking for a person. All of these things are the actions involved in the process of human trafficking, the process of exploitation. And these could all be done by one person, 
calling all the shots, making all the money, doing all the things, or they can be played by a series of people. And the person being exploited may have no idea that all of these people in their life are connected in this way, that they're all playing a part. Sometimes the people that are playing a part may not realize they're part of a bigger picture. But when we step back and we look at the story, these are some of the elements. We're looking at, did any of these things happen to this person who's experienced this abuse? Were they bought, sold? Were they transported? Were they recruited? And that kind of helps us see this isn't just abuse or this isn't just trafficking or this isn't just an unhealthy situation. We can classify this as trafficking. But then the question becomes, right, how does a person end up in this situation? And how does an exploiter gain so much control over another person that this person would then work for them, perform a service for them? And that's where we see these kind of categories of control. And when we talk about these, I, I want to talk about them in the context of abuse, because by themselves, they are abusive. So when we look at trafficking, we are kind of breaking down these means of control in these three categories, force, fraud, and coercion. Now, when we hear stories of human trafficking, how many of you guys have heard the kidnapping stories? Right? Okay, absolutely. We hear a lot of those violence stories. Someone snatched and then contained, locked up somewhere. And those are the ones that really get us going because we really deeply feel the injustice of that. We really, and it scares us. There's a major fear factor there. This idea that people could just be snatched off the street and whisked and locked away somewhere. And while that can and does happen, that is actually the least common way that people are brought into this life of trafficking. When we hear force, we can think of physical things like kidnapping, like being locked or contained somewhere. We can also think of drugging, um, not knowing the language, not having a means of transportation. So we can kind of look at force as anything physical, violence, um, sleep deprivation, food deprivation, physical means of control can be classified as force. But then there's fraud. And most of us don't think of lies as a means of control. But how many of you have jobs? Okay, awesome. Love that for you. <laughs> how many of you guys get paid every second that you're working? It's just rolling it. Nobody does, right? Most of us get paid every two weeks. So when I go to work, I'm trusting that in two weeks, I'm going to get the paycheck for, that, for the job I'm doing right now. The belief that I have that I'm going to get paid is what's causing me to do the thing. Belief is a powerful motivator. It is a powerful means of control. And so if you sell somebody a lie and they buy into that lie, that's powerful. That's a means of control. We don't often think about lies or someone pretending to be something they're not or pretending to offer you something they didn't actually intend to give you as a means of control. But that's one of the most common that we see and sometimes that's the most powerful when they pretend to be a boyfriend, a girlfriend, a big brother, a big sister figure. Oh, I'm getting mic instructions and I don't think I'm doing it very well. <laughs> Put in the holder, we got it. We don't need to hold it, there you go. Thank you, we love it. Pretending to be something they're not, pretending to offer you something they don't actually intend to give you, these people will become this dream person to someone. And we'll talk about this grooming process in a second, but that is a powerful means of control. And when you buy into the lie, you can also buy into the liar. And the relationship that's formed there can be incredibly powerful. And then coercion is the mental, emotional, psychological manipulation that occurs. This is where the gaslighting happens. This is where people that are exploited are made to feel like this person was nice to me, so I owe them. Or they're told, hey, that gift I gave you, that handbag I bought you, well, surprise, you owe me for that. The drugs I gave you that I said were free, well, now they're not free, and this is what you have to do to pay me back. And all of a sudden, they find themselves in a debt they had no idea they were getting into. Or maybe it's, hey, I know this about you, and if you don't do what I say, I'm going to report you. Or I have all these pictures of you, and if you don't do what I say, these are going to go all over the internet, and your whole family is going to know what you've been doing. So they hold things over them. If it's not you, it's your little sister. We know where your family lives. And this is where the threats really come into play. But it could also be, if you love me, you'll do this. Where else are you going to go? 
I saved you from the foster care system. You want to go back? Be my guest. So this is really where a lot of that control really sticks. And when we think about victims of human trafficking, and especially when they're portrayed in the media, we see duct tape and chains. And I just want to say that is a disservice to the people that are experiencing this type of exploitation because that's not what it looks like. But they are kept in these situations, in these relationships, in these places where maybe from a healthy and a, a more free perspective, I'm like, how could you ever sit with that? But we don't know where they've come from. And so many times they are so afraid of what they're going to have to go back to, what they have to face again. And the very things that push them into this lifestyle, sometimes are the very things that keep them there because they don't know what's going to happen when they leave. And so we can see how this all happens. But if you look at all these means of control without that element of for the purpose of exploitation, they're abusive, right? They're manipulative, they're controlling. And then you add this controlling to the point where now I'm getting you to do something that benefits me. And now we've got trafficking. And most of the time, people that are experiencing exploitation do not realize that that's what's happening to them. They think I'm in a bad situation, I'm in a bad relationship, I did this to myself, but they don't understand that maybe they, and they likely would never have been in that situation if this person hadn't played all these games to get them there in the first place. So there are different types of trafficking. In other words, these situations can look a thousand different ways. So there is labor trafficking. We have an extensive issue with labor trafficking here in Texas. Labor trafficking is when anyone is forced or lied to or threatened or coerced into providing a labor or a service. And we know that people are being trafficked in construction, in agriculture, in our hospitality industries, in our restaurants, in our nail salons. And they're not getting paid for their work and they can't leave their job because their IDs and their passports were taken from them. Their families are threatened. They're treated violently or their employer also provides their housing and their transportation and they are their movements are controlled and they cannot leave these abusive and oppressive work situations. That's labor trafficking. Sex trafficking is a similar concept that lies threats, blackmail, the violence, all of that is used to induce someone to perform a work or service, but that work or service is commercial sex. And commercial sex can really be defined as the exchange of a sex act of any kind for something of value of any kind. So it's not just prostitution in the sense that we think of sex for money. It could be stripping in exchange for drugs. It could be webcam action in exchange for some college tuition paid off or bills paid. Any sex act of any kind for something of value of any kind is commercial sex. And when that occurs because the person engaged in commercial sex was lied to, threatened, blackmailed, manipulated, tricked, they have been sex trafficked. And so you can see how, right, we're reframing past situations of, oh, that was just a bad situation or, man, it's just a, a mom down on her luck, or she likes it, she wants to do it, or he's into that kind of thing, right? We're, we're reframing and saying, no, if, if, if there was any of hint of this kind of thing, this is exploitation. This is not a person willingly engaged in this lifestyle. But I make the distinction about commercial sex because it's important to understand that in the United States, anyone under the age of 18 engaged in commercial sex is always considered to have been sex trafficked. In other words, there's never a question of they wanted to do this, they chose to do this. They're not old enough to consent to sex. They're definitely not old enough to consent to commercial sex. And so this could be a youth on the street that exchanges a sex act for a place to stay or for a meal from Whataburger. This could be a 16-year-old girl with a sugar daddy who's going to put money towards her car. They could have a big neon sign on their forehead that says, I know what I'm doing. I'm old enough. I I'm, I'm making money, but if they're under the age of 18, the law automatically says they have been sex trafficked, which means it's never their fault. It means that there was an adult that took advantage of them. And that's really important for them to understand. Youth really don't like to be called victims of sex trafficking. A lot of people, most survivors don't like to be called that. But especially youth, and especially youth that had to make some really hard decisions to stay alive on the streets. So it's really important that they understand, hey, there was an adult that took advantage of you. You're not weak. You're not stupid. 
you didn't make a bad decision. It's just that this person should have helped you for free and they ask you to do a sexual favor for them instead and that's not okay. And so helping youth understand that it's never their fault. They can never be legally implicated for anything like that and there's always help for them. So why are we talking about this? Why do we need to know? Well, the University of Texas did this mapping study a few years ago. And just in our, this was our first look ever at data and numbers for the state of Texas. And our very initial look at numbers for Texas revealed there are about 313,000 victims of human trafficking in our Lone Star State alone. Of those, 234 were victims of labor trafficking, and the remaining 79,000 were youth and minors that were being sex trafficked just in Texas. I need to point out to you that this study did not include adult victims of sex trafficking. In other words, that number is not anywhere near what it should be. So again, first look at numbers in Texas revealed that there are 79,000 youth and minors that are being exploited for sex in Texas. And for this study, that meant those that were 25 years old and younger. And so we know that it's happening in our state. We know that it's happening all around us. And while Houston often gets touted as a major hub or a big city, it is not just a big city issue. There's trafficking happening in every outlying county around here. Um, we know because we work with those people that have experienced that. And we're talking to these kids in these schools from our rural communities and our urban communities and our suburban communities. It really does happen across the board. And what we're noticing um, in our work with our clients, but also nationally, um, our latest data from the Polaris Project, who runs the National Human Trafficking Hotline, asks those clients that are engaging with them, calling the hotline, receiving help through the national hotline. They're finding out, hey, who, who was your exploiter? How did you get involved in this situation in the first place? And as of 2020, the most common way that most people experienced sex trafficking was by a family member. Familial trafficking is absolutely a reality, um, and it's one that we don't like to face, but it's really important that we do understand that this can happen in the context of families. And so again, that really pops that white van bubble, the, the, the zip ties on the car, stranger in the parking garage kind of bubble um, when it's mom or dad or grandpa or uncle that's doing this to you. And it's very difficult for those people to disentangle that this is my exploiter, but also my provider because I'm a child or this is my caregiver or my family member and the person that's causing me this harm. The second most common is that romantic situation. So again, this is where someone really builds up someone's trust, builds that relationship, and then uses that relationship as a means to get them to do something that will benefit them in the end. For labor trafficking, generally speaking, that is their trafficker is going to be their employer. And that is where that's kind of their entryway into this life of labor trafficking. But family members and intimate partners can also be a part of that story as well. So how does this happen? And I want to kind of break down the process of someone being exploited. So when we hear this image, right, of someone being snatched off the street, I'm going to be honest. I, I, if you call me like a fight, flight, or freeze person, I'm going to be your freeze girl. I just, I'm going to shut down. But if you snatch me off the street and this is what you're trying to do to me, I'm probably going to fight back. Like, I'm probably not going to make it easy for you. Something's going to kick in, and hopefully I'm going to, like, make you work for it. Now, I have worked with um, d difficult littles. And if you've ever worked with a child throwing a tantrum, you know that sometimes it's just, it's a lot, right? Well, traffickers are the same way. Like, why... Do we always, why does the media portray this idea that they're going to snatch someone off the street and then, like, that's a lot of energy to snatch somebody up and then beat them into submission or whatever's happening there. When, what if I could just make you think that you want to do this? And when that stops working, what if I can just make you think that you have to do this? And then when you stop believing that, maybe then I'll show you that if you stop, I'm going to pull out a show of force or power and remind you that I'm the bigger person here. But I'm going to start by making you think that you want to do this. And so traffickers are going to hijack a very basic element of human psychology. 
this attachment theory where we attach to or bond to people that meet a need for us, that's what they do. So they're looking for what is it that you need that you don't have? And then I'm going to be that for you. So your dad wasn't there for you when you were a kid. I'll come to your games. You and your mom fight. I'll take you shopping. I'll talk about girl stuff. You've never felt like you belonged. You're one of us now. You're with me. Whatever it is that you need, and maybe you don't even know that you need it, but they do because that's their job and they're great at it. What is, what's that heart need? Do you need to be seen? Do you need to be given an opportunity? And they're going to be that thing for you. And they're going to be that thing so much that while you are flooded with this, oh my goodness, this is the best thing I've ever seen or heard or felt, you're not going to realize that they're taking advantage. And so these might be some of the places where they're looking to see vulnerabilities or unmet needs. And it could be these major ones in orange, but man, family dysfunction, <laughs> don't we all, right? There's, there's going to be maybe some, some mental struggle or some isolation, especially after COVID. So what is it that you need that you don't have? And I'm going to be that need for you. And while I'm making this relationship and while I'm flooding you with this euphoric experience of a relationship or an opportunity or a connection, you're not going to notice that you're not hanging out with your family as much. And all of a sudden, maybe your old friends don't seem like your real people because now you found me or you found us, this group, this community, and, and now you want to belong here. And you don't notice that I'm asking for all of your time and attention because you're happy to give it to me. And then maybe weeks and months go by and you don't know, but everyone else in your life knows that you're not showing up to school as much. You're not on the soccer team or you're not making band practice. You're not coming home at night and your attitudes change and your dress has changed. And meanwhile, the person experiencing this is kind of pulled into this other person's world. And their goal is to replace a person's support system. So whatever your support system was, one by one, all of those strings that connected, and healthy people have a lot of strings. We're well diversified. But when you're being exploited, this person wants to make every string attached to themselves. Your housing, your money, your relationships, your opportunity, your future, all of that becomes them. And when the relationship's great, that's fine. When it's not great, now you're trapped. Now you're stuck and now you don't know what to do. And you look back and you think, I did this to myself because I said yes to that party and I said yes to that drug and I told off my mom when she told me this guy was no good or I, I just told her that this is my girlfriend, I can have friends now and, and this is who I am. And so I must have done this. And they look back and they see a string of decisions and choices they made and they think, I guess I deserve this or I guess this is what happened to me. And they don't realize that they never would have made those choices if someone hadn't handed it to them on a silver platter. And to the people in their life, for those of us maybe on the outside, it can look like they just started making bad decisions. They just fell in with the wrong crowd. We can get our own feelings hurt, right? If that's our friend or our kid, our sibling pushing us away, we might not realize who's on the other side and what's happening there. But it is a very intentional process to replace a person's support system. I want to point out again in the sense of familial trafficking, there's no need to replace a support system. They are the support system. And it's built in. Now, a lot of these relationships can happen in person. A lot of them are happening online. And this is really where a lot of people are meeting their potential exploiters is through these online connections and relationships and especially on college campuses. And I don't have time to go into seeking arrangements or sugaring, um, but if you are not familiar with the dangers of sugaring, I highly recommend that you do some research and learn how nuanced these sugar daddy, sugar baby relationships can be. Um, and I want you to know that there are certain websites and apps that are specifically targeting college students. Um, because we need money, am I right? So that's, they're looking for people that are in need um, and it can be very dangerous for those that are involved. So what can we do as outsiders, as community members, how can we engage and see, is this process of grooming or trafficking happening to someone around us? 
So we might notice there's a change in their academic attendance or performance. Oftentimes, we're going to see a very big shift in their personality and how they dress and how they talk and what they're into, what they like. And if we're really close to them, we might notice that all of this change is happening when they met a certain person or a certain group of people, that all of a sudden things started to kind of spiral. Maybe that person is older than them. Maybe they're traveling frequently or they're running away frequently. And, and maybe when you ask about it, they're giving vague or canned answers or responses. Maybe they seem to not have a ton of control over where they go or who they talk to. Or maybe they're very afraid that this person in their life is going to be mad if they're talking to you about it. Or they seem very concerned about what this person has to say. Maybe you notice that they might be involved in a gang or there's some kind of gang history or gang community involved. Um, there might be attempts to conceal physical marks, but also um, emotionally. They might be really standoffish. They don't want to talk to you. They don't want to answer your questions. Um, maybe they begin to wear longer shirts if there are if there is physical abuse happening. You might notice that there might be signs of them trying to cover that up. Hyperarousal or hypoarousal means that they're like anxious, on edge, stressed, or shut down, disengaged, checked out. These are just kind of maybe more specific that you may or may not see, but maybe you're starting to see signs that they're keeping records of sales being made or transactions occurring. Um, maybe they've got large amounts of cash, especially if they start showing up wearing items that they used to not be able to afford before. Really nice clothes or their hair is done or they've got new kicks or they've got an additional cell phone. Those might be some other signs as well that, and again, right, one of these signs is, doesn't mean that they are being trafficked, but it's a constellation. And it's always a place to just press in and lean and ask more questions. Um, oftentimes, people that are being exploited are, are given a script by their trafficker or by their exploiter. Um, so I just encourage people, just keep asking questions until they run out of scripted answers. And then you might be able to gauge, are they speaking of their own accord or are they just saying what someone else told them to say? If you believe that you are witnessing trafficking and it's of a minor, um, as mandated reporters in the state of Texas, we have to report that to law enforcement and DFPS. Um, and so that's kind of a little bit of information there. But in general, here are some hotline numbers. And I encourage you to take a picture of this slide. Um, the National Human Trafficking Hotline is an excellent resource for questions. Um, if you're not sure what you're seeing, if you have concerns, if you have a tip, if you have an actual report, if you yourself are experiencing this, this is an amazing resource. Um, I'm also leaving our referral line as we do have a 24-7 crisis response line um, for identified survivors of trafficking. So because we're not law enforcement, we might not be able to figure it out if you're not sure. But if that is the situation, our advocates can be on scene within 90 minutes. So thank you so much for your time. I hope as we move forward, this kind of gives a foundation. Um, but thank you all for being here today. Thank you, Krista. So now that Krista has given an overview of human trafficking, Kathy Givens is going to be doing a deep dive into who is at risk. Um, Kathy Givens is with 1211. They are a nonprofit that does supports at all levels for survivors as they heal and thrive. And Kathy is also on the United States Council on Human Trafficking. Welcome, Kathy. Thank you so much for having me. Um, Krista pretty much hijacked my whole entire presentation, but I'm going to just jump in and take a deeper dive um, like Rhonda alluded to. Um, Krista covered what human trafficking was, right? The federal definition, what we can look out for, the language behind it. What I want to do is really make it, uh, really make it practical, right? And so that we are able to identify the people that are living amongst us in plain sight that are potentially victims and persons of human trafficking that have experienced human trafficking. So how do we do that? We first have to understand, well, who's at risk? Who's at risk of human trafficking? What does human trafficking look like? So just by a show of hands, does anyone on the panel look like they have experienced human trafficking? Just by a show of hands. Do I look like I have experienced human trafficking? No one wants to be offensive. Brave man in the green shirt. I like that participation. So really, I'm not a victim of human trafficking, but I am an overcomer of human trafficking, right? So trafficking can look like me, 
I'm a little older now. But you know, trafficking can look like me. It can look like the person sitting next to you. It can look like the person sitting in front of you. The fact is that human trafficking does not discriminate. It can look like anyone. It's victims. Um, I always say that human trafficking doesn't target people per se. It targets vulnerabilities. Has anyone in this room ever been vulnerable? All of us, right? And so that's what traffickers are seeking for. They're seeking for vulnerabilities. I think you heard that in Krista's presentation is that they're seeking to fill a void. What is it that this person needs? What is it that this person is lacking? And how can I be that for that person? All to take that person's freedom for profit. And that's typically, that's just in general, that's what human trafficking is. And so as we take a deeper dive into what it looks like, um, I'm going to cover some scenarios. Uh, trafficking does not require movement. We heard Krista talk about going from state to state. That is absolutely can be trafficking, but it doesn't require movement. That's one thing that we need to remember. Trafficking can happen in a household, familial trafficking. Trafficking can happen in our city, in our schools, in our churches, in our you know, grocery stores. It can happen right in front of us. So it doesn't necessarily require movement. When we see and we hear stories of people potentially um, coming through our borders we automatically think, oh my gosh, that's, they've been trafficked, but that's actually smuggling most of the time. Now they can come here because of their vulnerabilities and become trafficked persons, but nine times out of 10, that's smuggling. And there's a big difference between smuggling and human trafficking. Of course, uh, there are certain vulnerabilities that intensify um, individuals for being targeted for human trafficking, right? And some of those uh, vulnerabilities are the same things that we deal with every single day. So victims may be forced to work. That is labor trafficking, right? We talked about begging. When we see people on the streets, our unhoused residents that are asking for money, or maybe they're selling something. You see people with the cards and they're, the poster boards, and they're like, hey, you know, stop and give me money. Can I have a dollar? Nine times out of 10, we're thinking, oh, okay, well, they're just unhoused and they just need support. Those individuals are not only are there, are they severe risk of being trafficked, but those persons can also be victims of human trafficking because peddling and uh, panhandling and begging, those are forms of human trafficking. A lot of times traffickers will force these individuals out on the street. And what we think of when we think of labor trafficking is yes, that two week paycheck, that nine to five, you're being forced into agriculture or construction or forestry or fishery, landscaping even. But sometimes it's no, go out on the street and ask for money. They're not trading sex, but they're asking for money. Sex trafficking can happen through escort services, we're most familiar with that, right, Julia Roberts. Escort services, outdoor solicitation, which is what we typically society has, um, we view as prostitution. So if we see individuals that are soliciting, we say, oh my gosh, they're, they're being prostituted, right? And again, I just want to be mindful of the language. The next three days, we're really gonna try to retrain your minds and shift the paradigm, right? And so the language is very important. When we think of outdoor solicitation and persons being um, forced into trafficking, we don't want to use language like prostitution. That's a very separate thing. But if we look at those people as potential victims of trafficking, prostituted people even, that kind of helps to reframe our mindset and our perspective. And what that does is just open us up to a whole new world of learning when we really shift our perspective on what those people may be going through. Um, pornography is huge. That's another way that people are potentially being trafficked. A lot of times when we think of um, pornography, we think that it's just you know voluntary participation as means to make money. But I have friends and close um, colleagues that have experienced this type of trafficking 
and they are absolutely forced. So what people may see coming through their screens for pleasure, they're actually witnessing someone being trafficked. They're actually witnessing real rape, real torture, right? And so we can't talk about human trafficking or sex trafficking specifically without talking about pornography. The two definitely intersect and those that's very important to remember. Remote interactive sexual acts, so the webcams, that's another way that people experience sex trafficking specifically. Personal sexual servitude. So again, it doesn't require movement, but if one person is taking advantage of an individual and profiting off of that individual, maybe recording these acts and selling them to um, their friends or even putting it online for other people to see, that is human trafficking, right? Even if that person is in the house and they're not being moved, like throughout the streets or from, um, you know, job to job, they're in the house, they're not going anywhere, it's still human trafficking. Strip clubs and cantinas are huge too. So again, kind of like pornography. And again, we are not talking about um, commercial sex work, right? There, that's a whole different ca category to get into. What we're addressing over the next three days is trafficking, right? Individuals who have absolutely been victimized. So can we say that um, there may be people in strip clubs that are there voluntarily? Yes, we can. But we know that strip clubs is a huge, huge facilitator of human trafficking, right? This is where trafficking happens. A lot of those individuals in the strip clubs are forced to be there. They have pimps, they have traffickers that are making them do this. Is it for everyone? No, absolutely not, but trafficking can happen. So we need to remember the closeness of it and the intersection of trafficking. Um, I'm gonna go into some a deeper dive on like what the victims of human trafficking may look like, again, Trafficking doesn't discriminate, but I want to take a deeper dive as it relates to race and human trafficking. So 40.4% 40, 40 of all trafficking survivors are black, and this is according to Health and Human Services. 14.8% of all labor trafficking survivors are Asian. Again, this is another H, uh, human Health and Human Services fact. Worldwide, indigenous people are at high risk of trafficking for both labor and sex. Does anyone know why that is? Because they typically won't report. They can't report. They have no outlet to report. There's no jurisdiction allowing them to report, right? Um, so indigenous people are definitely at severe, severe, severe risk of being trafficked. When we talk about data like this, and when we talk about the 79,000 youth that were identified in Texas a few years ago, I want to make be clear that these statistics are people that have been identified, meaning people that have either called into like the National Human Hotline, uh, Human Trafficking Hotline um, number, or people that have said, you know, gone through the justice system and have been identified as victims of trafficking. So then, there's a whole other world out there of people that have not been identified as human trafficking. And if, we're, if we were at 79,000 a few years ago, can we imagine where we really are today even, especially post pandemic? So another population, another community that is severely at risk is LGBTQI plus homeless youth. So according to a study, LGBTQIA plus homeless youth are twice as likely to experience trafficking. And a lot of times, these individuals are already outcasted by family, society, communities, so they don't even have the supports to turn to, right? They're already outcasted. And so that leaves them at severe risk for traffickers to target that. Remember, they're looking for vulnerabilities. If they don't have family, who's gonna be their family? Traffickers. If they don't have a support system, who's going to be that support system? Traffickers. If they're not accepted by their family or accepted in their communities, who's going to accept them just as they are? Traffickers. And trafficking can happen. A lot of times when we think of trafficking, we think of, we automatically think of the young woman in distress or the young girl in distress, right? If we say human trafficking, 
that's kind of like the first image that comes to our minds. But I can tell you that data has proven that boys are very, very likely to be trafficked just as much as girls and women. Boys and men are being trafficked as well at very, very high rates. And so when we think of trafficking, we have to think of human trafficking, right? Men, boys, women, girls, the queer community, like all people with vulnerabilities are at risk of being trafficked. So some of the vulnerabilities that intensify um, challenges for individuals that are targets for human trafficking can be a history of abuse. A lot of times they do have a history of abuse in their families, or um, we talked about unhoused people. So unhoused people, that because they have that major need for shelter, they can be at risk for trafficking as well. And then we have people, we have youth, right? We have youth that are maybe truant because of one reason or the other, um, substance use disorders, intensify challenges for people of being trafficked. People with disabilities are targets for traffickers as well. And so all of these things intensify these challenges, but again, pointing back to trafficking does not discriminate. I wanna break down some of the things that uh, Crystal alluded to as far as like that grooming process or that process of seduction. How are these traffickers able to even get to these people, right? How are they able to get to our friends and colleagues and family members? Like how are they able to target us in the first place? Well, there are a lot of facilitators involved in the process of getting to victims, right? Social media right now being the number one thing. I call social media the trafficker's hunting ground by far. And they're not only just looking for vulnerable youth, they're looking for vulnerable people. So they can, you know, this they can, you know, we, we use the term catfishing as a joke, but these traffickers are literally grooming other people to become traffickers, right? For them. And so social media is the main place right now. Um, hotels, motels. All of these are facilitators of trafficking, meaning when I say facilitators is where are people being trafficked, right? Like where are they, where are they being targeted? How are these traffickers able to come in and target these people? It can be at the store. It can be at the grocery store. It can be at Starbucks. It can be at churches. It can be anywhere, anywhere that they see that there's a vulnerability. We can literally be amongst traffickers and not even know it because traffickers, they don't have a look. Just like victims don't have a look, traffickers don't have a look. When we think of pimps, the first thing that we see is like the purple suit and the big ring maybe, right? The big hat, the big chain. And, you know, jokingly, we see, we see them on movies now and, and it's, it's funny, right? But really, traffickers don't look like that. Not all of them. I have seen them, but they don't look like that. They look like... 18 year old boys on the football team at school. They look like the little girl that's on the choir, right? They look like soccer moms. They look like football coaches. They look like all of these people that are amongst us. So trafficking does not have a look. The different types of traffickers, um, Krista also broke these down. I wanna go into it a little bit more. We have a colleague um, who is a survivor leader that kind of just really honed in on what types of traffickers are out there. And this is just a very limited list, but first we have the Romeo pimp. The Romeo is gonna make you feel good. The Romeo is usually someone that is trying to use their charm to really like get to their victims and make them fall in love with them and they become their whole world. The Romeo is what you can, is, is usually the boyfriend girlfriend relationship. That's, that's how that starts. And so they befriend the individual and then they seduce them through romance. The CEO pimp is one that will offer an individual a job, a promising career modeling or, you know, a video vixen or like just a regular job. Like you're being, in my, for myself, it was, I was being transported from Houston to Dallas, Texas for an admin position. So it can be just any kind of job, a pro, some kind of promising career. The gorilla pimps, 
these are traffickers that we're kind of more familiar with. Like this, these are the traffickers that we hear about on the news and in the movies. They use force, they use abuse. They're very violent usually. Um, we can kind of associate them with abduction and like just real violence. And that's typically how they are throughout the course of, um, of their process of seduction, their grooming process. And then we have someone that we identify as the partner. The partner can be like, hey, let's do this together. And so they use manipulation. Like this is me and you, this is our dream. This is what we want to do. We're supposed to graduate from school together. We're supposed to get that degree together. So let's, let's us do this together. And so that's the partner. They'll make it, they'll make you feel like you're making the choice with them, right? And then we have familial, familial trafficking. Krista covered this. This is a family member. This is someone that is literally your family. Um, and that's another way that individuals are trafficked as well. The main thing that I want to leave you here with is that trafficking does not discriminate. There is no look for its victims. There, are, there is no look for its, for the people that are traffickers, right? For the perpetrators. And so whatever image that you've had in your mind about what trafficking looks like, I want you to get rid of that. And I want you to really pay attention for the next three days because you have, you probably know nine times out of 10, everyone in this room knows someone that has either been impacted by trafficking or that has been impacted by the trafficker, right? And so we all have touched trafficking because we live in Houston and, and it's affecting our humanity. I would challenge you to really, really open your minds these next three days because we can come in here and we can talk about it and we can talk about trafficking and we can leave here and we can go on with our lives. But if you just really dive in and put yourselves for the next three days in the shoes of that victim, survivor or overcomer and really think about how trafficking is impacting not only our city, but our nation and our world. This is not just a cause, this is not just a crime. Trafficking is people being victimized every single day for profit. It could be our friends, it could be our loved ones. So open up your minds and just be ready to receive the information. And you know, if you know someone that has experienced trafficking, we're cool. We're cool, ask questions, partner with survivors, partner with overcomers, get to know what trafficking is on the ground level in layperson's language, right? What does it really look like and how is it affecting my community? Thank you all so much. Thank you, Kathy. So the takeaway from Kathy's speech is there is no typical trafficker, there's no typical victim, there's no typical buyer. Traffickers will look for vulnerabilities and those vulnerabilities will be regardless of sex, gender, religion, socioeconomic status. And so that's why we're here today. We're here to learn, to be able to take this information and go back to your friends, your family, and your loved ones. So we're going to pivot a little bit and we're going to talk about something different. We're going to talk about demand for buying sex. Vanessa Forbes and Fong Marquez are very well-known advocates that speak in the demand side of sex buying. Welcome. Hi, uh, thank you so much first for everyone coming tonight on a Tuesday night and equipping and empowering yourself with this knowledge. And before I even begin, I just want to thank you so much, Kathy, for um, everything that you shared. Krista, you too. It's such an honor and privilege to be able to um, be on this panel of, of people. And so I hope you guys um, feel like you're treated to just um, the, the expert knowledge that is on this panel tonight. So um, I just want to begin first by saying that our director, who's a treasure trove of knowledge and demand work, unfortunately couldn't be here tonight because of a personal family emergency. Um, but me and my partner, Vanessa, we're program leads in our organization. And so um, wherever there's gaps in our knowledge, um, I do apologize. And please, if you have questions, um, please still ask them. And if we can't answer them, please get our information so that we can follow up with you with the information that, that you need. And so 
let's begin. <laughs> Demand disruption, we are an anti-trafficking organization, but we do our work in fighting demand through demand reduction strategies. And we focus on two different ways. First, eliminating buyer motivation. And the second is reducing buyer access to the exploited. And so um, for us, we're one of the few demand-focused organizations in the US, and we're one of the leading organizations fighting demand here in our city. In the last five years, these are the things that we've worked on. Um, developing successful demand deterrent programs, gathering unique buyer-informed data, committing to supporting law enforcement and legal efforts to maximize operation and arrest results, and last, successfully facilitated hundreds of buyer rehabilitations so that sex buyers don't offend and buy again. And we do this in our approach in multiple ways. Um, I will be walking through prevention, intervention, and post-arrest, and Vanessa will come and she'll cover legislative and also disrupting suspected illicit massage business operations, which is she's one of the leading experts in this in our state, arguably. And so I'm very excited for us to be able to present this information to you tonight. So let's start with prevention. You know, when we're talking about buying, a 25-year-old sex buyer today is not a 2022 problem. This issue begins further back because it's a 2015 problem and a 2012 problem and going all the way to 2006 because when we look at our work in demand, it exists on this timeline and it starts at age nine and this is the average age of exposure to pornography, average. So that means that there are kids now younger than age nine that are being exposed to pornography. And the impacts of this built to age 12, age 15, 18, and all the way to the end at 21, and this is the average age of first purchase. And as you can see, these, um, these aspects of demand they compound upon each other. And we're not saying, of course, that everyone starts at age nine having exposure to pornography, ends up at age 21 purchasing, but we are saying that an overwhelming percentage of the people that we work with, the buyers that we work with, they have stated that there is a problem with their, where they had an addiction to pornography which contributed to this issue. And so when we see these other impacts of these ages, we can kind of see and draw together how being a part of a very hypersexualized culture, and then at age 12, this is the introduction to a smartphone. At age 15, one in four kids are experiencing sexting and you know what our previous presenters have talked about, sextortion. And then going into age 18, this is kind of that rite of passage where this is the first you know, visit to the strip club, but also at the same time, this is also when girls are aging out of the foster care system, which this is another group that has been identified as a very vulnerable population to trafficking. And so when we look at this, we have to think about how can we disrupt that timeline so that someone who starts at age nine doesn't end up at age 21. And it's so important that we do that by equipping and empowering communities people like you here tonight to have conversations because you can effectively do something about fighting trafficking in your own spheres and in your own circles. So love people, this is one of our workshops where we coach you and give you the tools to walk with someone in your life that might be struggling with an addiction. Because if someone in your life came up to you right now and said, I'm struggling with a pornography addiction, would you be ready to have that conversation with them? Disrupt demand, we go over the exploitation that exists in the cycle of supply and demand that must be disrupted. And we cover what Vanessa will talk about a little bit later, the illicit massage business industry and how it impacts human trafficking, especially in Houston. And then Defend Home. This is our workshop that we give to families, specifically to community organizations and churches specifically, so that we can equip families to be able to have conversations with the young ones in their lives. And this is, of course, not just for parents, but if you have a younger sister, or a younger brother, how do you talk to them about growing up in a hypersexualized culture? How do you talk to them about exposure to something that they've seen? And so it's important that we have these conversations because 
as Jason, I'm quoting here, he's a convicted sex buyer and a part of one of our programs. He says that the decision to buy sex started with a pornography addiction, 100%. And we had to think about the dangers of pornography because it's a business. It has a sales cycle. It does not care about the consequences that it has on the people that are consuming it, the mental health implications, but also the people that are impacted by consumers of pornography. Because here, as you see this escalation dynamic, it starts off you know, at the bottom where this is softcore pornography. And with the addictive nature of pornography that some studies have stated is as addictive as cocaine, of course, they're going to continue to want more. And so when you have you know, that addictive nature of it, it goes from softcore to hardcore pornography. And then we've talked about webcam services. And the thing, too, is that all of this exists on the same website. And so it's super easy to go from one to the next. And then from there, going into a strip club business and then reaching the end where you're at a, an illicit massage business or, unfortunately, soliciting. And now that it is a felony offense to be arrested for solicitation, this has dire consequences for the people that are arrested, but also for the people that are in this person's life. Mike, who was arrested for solicitation, he says, you just described the last four years of my life. It cost me my marriage and a lot more. I never thought of it all being connected. I'm tired of living like this. And so we've talked a lot too about, you know, how victims, you know, it doesn't discriminate. Traffickers, it doesn't discriminate. Same thing with bikes. And so in the intervention program, we partner with law enforcement and our law enforcement intervention partnership, we engage with alleged sex buyers at the point of arrest to offer the opportunity to seek help. And these are some of our statistics that we've gathered over the past couple of years of working in this space. So we've talked to over 400 men at the point of arrest, 84% of men give us their number so that we can contact them and get them help. We've committed to four, over 4,200 volunteer hours in this program. And then this is some of the statistics of the buyers that are arrested. 63% of them are married. 46% of them have children. 44% of them are churchgoers. And over 90% of these buyers, they found um, the escort that they were answering to or going to an illicit, massage, um, an illicit massage business via online or through pornography. And so when we just look at those numbers there, it paints this picture that this issue, it impacts people and people that are in our churches, people that are married, people that have families. And it all goes back to that timeline that we talked about earlier because it all kind of boils down to how do we combat this hypersexualized culture and all the things that play into this. And so these men, um, often when they're at this point of rest and the realization that all of this is connected, all of this connected for them, they say, I'm glad I got caught. And this statement's only possible once the buyers realize their, the connection between their addictions, the experiences, and their ultimate decision to buy. And so once they have that realization, it's so important that we are able to support them so that they don't buy again. So our STAR program is our Sex Buyers Transformation and Restoration Program. It's to eliminate buyer motivation and disrupt the demand cycle through accountability. Because I've mentioned, you know, 63% of, the, of them are married. 44% of them, you know, go to church. There are people that have been impacted by these decisions. And so we walk through this program um, and we have our Defender Bridge method, which is uh, done in collaboration with the clinician on how to help people through addiction. And so we have our volunteers who are our defenders, and they are paired up with a participant, someone who's been arrested. And we walk through this uh, journey with them through support, 
through giving them information, through counsel and coaching them, and then through accountability and giving them all of this information for them to understand the implications of their decisions and what their decisions have done in a contextualized, localized, and then also into this journey of accountability in a very sustainable way. And so, um, and so that way we can get them from one side to the other side. So I, I will, um, I won't read this letter to you, but um, I just wanted to state that uh, in our program, we have uh, all of our participants write a letter to the woman that they would have bought. And so I just want this to sink in, the, the processing of guilt, the understanding of the actions that they made that affected the other person that affected the people in their lives and the person that they would have that they would have bought. And once we are able to have this understanding of the implications of their actions, then we can actively see a, an addressing of this issue from the demand side and that making an impact to the other side. And so I'm gonna give the stage over to Vanessa and Vanessa is gonna walk us through the last portion of our presentation on demand. Thank you so much, Fung. Okay, Demand Disruption has recently gone involved in advocating for legislation. Now I'm gonna go really quick through these slides because I only have five minutes. <laughs> um, over the past legislative session, we have testified on five bills, three of which have become laws. We are demand subject matter experts. We're on the governor's anti-trafficking advisory team, and we are on the office of a Texas Attorney General's legislative task force team. We were recently invited to be part of the Texas House Licensing Administrative Procedures Committee um, meeting. We were invite only, and we were subject, subject matter experts on solicit, illicit massage, suspected illicit massage businesses. We wanted to drive home where these were, so we showed each of the committee members on a map where the illicit massage businesses were in their district. Demand disruption has been involved in documentaries, book research, illicit massage business data gathering and research, ordinance reform, case studies, legislative briefs, and a doctorate dissertation. Disrupting IMBs. IMBs are illicit massage businesses. In the state of Texas, we have at least 1,300. 1,300 illicit massage businesses. In the US, we have 9,000 at least. That's what we know of. 12 customers per day is an average for an uh, illicit massage business. $2.5 billion annual national revenue. We know this information is going on because there are actual websites that are there to review illicit massage businesses. And we use those websites as our research. If you live in any of these surrounding areas, I'm from Katy. There are 33 illicit massage businesses in Katy. This is not just an, a, a citywide, this is, a, this is outside of Houston, this is in Texas problem. If we know where these places are, why don't we just shut them down? If they get shut down, won't they just won't come back right up? We have two different approaches. One is a proactive approach called How to Defend Your City. I'm gonna, okay. Um, it is a step-by-step -step online course that equips citizens to proactively influence local planning, zoning, and permitting processes in order to make illicit massage businesses untenable. Thanks to Rhonda and Joe, our executive director, we have successfully had 10 cities adopt these city ordinances. These ordinances are at no cost to the taxpayer. They are city code enforcement, fire marshal, and inspectors who visit these establishments as business open in municipalities. Once a conditional use permit is enacted, cities have this checklist to, on how to massage businesses can operate. If you've seen an illicit massage business, they have blacked out or obstructed front windows, living quarters, they have cash only, buzzers on the locked doors, all of these things, if you use a conditional use permit, these operations can no longer have those. 
the reactive. We know they're there, so what are we doing about it? Uh, I've been studying this since 2014. In 2018, Children at Risk and I created a map. We mapped over 672 illicit massage parlors. Now in 2022, we have over 1,300. That's during the time of COVID. I wanna point this out just because I think it's helpful for us to recognize these are not all unlicensed massage establishments. 740 of them are licensed massage establishments, which means they have a physical license through Texas Department of Licensing and Regulation. 250 of them have been sought violations for licensing and 150 of them for sex acts. We know this is going on. Texas Department of Licensing and Regulation knows this is going on. This is an ongoing problem that we need to be involved in. We have a program called How to Shut Down a Brothel. It's a step-by-step -step online course that equips citizens to safely shut down illicit massage parlors. It is for the average everyday person. They never step foot in an illicit massage business. They never step foot in any situation that would put them at, in harm or in risk. And it allows us to really um, work with the property owners to get these illicit massage businesses shut down. Where are these illicit massage businesses, you ask? All right. This is more than just a map. This is a tool. We have identified up to 18 points of data per location. The data is not just the address and the phone number, but also the licensing, the property owner. Are they on other illicit websites? And this is a 10 mile radius of us. Every pinpoint is an illicit massage business. I'm gonna ask Fung to come forward and just finish this up. Okay, I heard a lot of expressions. And so I hope we get some interesting questions at the panel, specifically for Vanessa. <laughs> uh, demand disruption going forward. And so once again, thank you so much for being here tonight and taking the time to attend this presentation. Um, we threw a lot at you and a lot of information that you might not have thought about from this perspective uniquely. But you know, I think I would hope for you to take away from this and over the next three days is that there's a place for you in fighting trafficking um, across all the spectrums from Chris's organization to ours, to Kathy's, wherever it is, wherever you feel to call to, please think about um, volunteering and being a part of this. And specifically for us, uh, demand reduction, it's a complex challenge that required a diversity community, diversified community-wide approach. You saw those 18 points of data research, they did not come you know, automatically. We have to have, um, you know, Vanessa spent numerous hours with uh, members of our team pulling this information. And so if you're into Excel spreadsheets, which I'm not, um, you know, if you're good at that, like, please, like, there's a place for you. Like, this is a part of fighting trafficking. And so just to kind of recap, these are our programs. And if any of these programs really spoke to you tonight, please consider um, talking to us, um, emailing us, and reaching out to us for, for um, to get involved in our programs, specifically to you know, at a college, we're always looking for interns to um, be a part of our programs. And so this is our information, info at demanddisruption.org. Um, please write it down. And um, if you have any other questions after this presentation, we'd love to be able to get in contact with you. And that is us. Thank you so much. I just want to uh, stop for a second because you have had a lot of information uh, given to you. It's like drinking from a, a fire hydrant, right? Uh, let's give our panel a round of applause. These are heroes in your midst, absolutely heroes in your midst, in our midst. Um, we have three questions from the from online I want to address. Uh, one is, and then we have uh, Tina Stahl who will be talking uh, immediately after these three questions, but I just wanted to give us a little bit of a break. 
I understand sex trafficking has been happening for a long time. Then why are so many media outlets speaking about it just now? Anyone want to answer that question? Or know how to answer that question? Okay, um, I can answer that briefly just from, um, there's been a lot of high profile cases, right? And so the, it's, been going long, it's been going on for a long time, but we haven't had any real high profile cases. And so we can name, we can name like R. Kelly, we can name Epstein, we can name all those high profile cases is what draws the media. So why are we hearing about trafficking now when it's been going on for ages? It's because of those high profile cases. This is why we hear it in the media. We, like boots on the ground, have been talking about it forever. Okay. Next question is, uh, will, and we don't need to discuss it now, but maybe perhaps at the end, will the panel discuss the amount of money being made? I'm sure it's a lot. Will you guys be talking about that later? Okay. Um, this is from Yesenia. Uh, if we know that they're there, why is it hard that, to get their licenses and, and shut them down? Um, it's actually a really long process. Um, for police law enforcement, it's at least a three to five month process to investigate just one establishment and to prove just one illicit massage establishment. And so police are working on it. We have worked with law enforcement and we know they're working on it. But we also know that the Texas Department of Licensing and Regulation has only certain capabilities. They don't have the ability to, they, they have an administrative, they don't have a criminal. So they can give fines and penalties for not having licensing, but they can't actually shut down. If that makes any sense and helps. Okay, um, I was trying to find, someone asked to show the slide with the hotline numbers again. Um, let me tell everybody that if you have, a any questions or you want resources, um, you can email me uh, at the center, and my email address is cpscr, so CPS, College of Public Service, CR, Community Relations, cpscr at uhd.edu, and I will get you the information from any of these people on the panel, and if they're also willing to share their information, we can get that to you as well. It's also in the brochure. Uh, we have a brochure, so um, hopefully you got that. All their information is in there. Nancy says, oh yeah, that's we just did that. I'll, I'll try to find that slide, Nancy. Rebecca says, thank you for doing this work and this presentation. Uh, Chad says, how can we redirect funds to fund community support services instead of more law enforcement? There we go, just patience, just a little patience and a button. I think I, I love that preventative approach, you know, where, again, looking at your community and seeing where are the unmet needs. If traffickers are the people that are looking for unmet needs and vulnerable people to exploit, can healthy, good-hearted, kind, intentional people meet those needs with no strings attached? And sometimes, absolutely, that looks like programs. Otherwise, a lot of us wouldn't be here. Um, but sometimes that looks like friendship. Sometimes that looks like being a good neighbor. Sometimes that looks like reaching out and getting to know someone in your class. And if they need a ride, maybe you can be that for them, or maybe you can help them study. So what does it look like to be a good friend? Never underestimate the power of just being a good friend, being a good neighbor asking questions even when it's uncomfortable. Um, and so I would just say, look at your community and see what are the unmet needs? How can I meet that on a personal level? How can I meet those on a financial level? Um, and then moving from there. Thank you. Um, 
And so uh, Stephanie says, how can I access this recorded meeting? It will be available on the college's YouTube channel in about one week. And uh, Deborah Evans says, you are brave women, and I applaud you. And indeed, you all are. OK, I'm going to turn this back over to Rhonda. Thank you. Whoa, that is a lot of information. So what comes with hearing all of this information? We are all very well aware as helping agencies and helping people that we suffer from lack of self-care, um, vicarious trauma. Tina Stahl works with Emerging Grace and she's gonna be covering self-care this evening. Thank you all for being here. I feel privileged to be a part of this group, um, really. Um, so whether you decide to go into um, working with sex trafficking victims or another population, self-care is really, really important. Um, I left the corporate world 20 years ago um, after raising uh, two thick-headed teenage boys as a single parent, and I decided that I was, I knew all the answers, so I was gonna go ahead and, and fix other people's kids. And I quickly realized I was wrong. And, um, but uh, in the search for helping, I discovered residential child care. And I also discovered the gap in services for sex trafficking victims. And that's how Emerging Grace came about. We decided that we wanted to focus on a residential campus specifically for adolescent sex trafficking. So that is in the making. But in the meantime, I've um, experienced, or I should say probably made a lot of mistakes with uh, crossing boundaries and not taking care of myself that really could have made me crash. So, um, oh, I didn't even move. Okay, so what drives us? Uh, we all, what we all have in common, I think, is compassion. We have empathy, right? We feel for uh, the population that we want to work with. And much like a car engine, we have an internal engine. Um, unlike a car, however, we don't have a, a check engine light that goes on when we're overheating or that there's a problem, right? So we have to build a, a, a relationship with our internal bodies and, and figure out when we're about to overheat and define what we're going to do about it. Okay, so everyone deals with stress, right? Everybody in this room can sit here and tell me what kind of stresses your day-to-day -day, uh, life have, but when you're dealing with your own stress and you're a caregiver, in addition to taking on your own stress, you're soaking in all the stresses of your uh, population. So when you're uh, dealing with these stresses, you have to develop boundaries. Now, in 20 minutes, I cannot define what uh, and break down what all those boundaries should be, right? Um, the biggest stressor for me tonight was that I had to fit all this training in a 20-minute presentation. Um, so you have to be able to ask for help, right? Um, it's not a sign of weakness for us to ask for help and ask for direction. It's really a sign of intelligence for us. Oh, and the one thing that I left out of here was um, coping skills. It's really important to identify your coping skills and know when you need to use them. So the consequences of what I call self-care deficiency is burnout, compassion fatigue, and vicarious trauma. Burnout happens slowly and it's reaction to work stresses. We graduate from school, right, and we take on our job and we're gonna take on the world, with that, the little part of the world that we wanna save. And we quickly realize that um, there's a lot of policies and procedures and permissions and bosses and everybody in the way, right? And we get discouraged. So we slowly lose hope little by little. Compassion fatigue. Uh, it's relational, it's a failure to care, 
and rescue and it happens really quickly because you're you're like a sponge and when you're sitting there with client after client after client and not taking care of yourself you're absorbing it like a sponge and if you're not taking the time to like squeeze out that sponge once in a while you're 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 just going to drown vicarious trauma your your change your view of the world will will change at times because you get the sense of hopelessness that nothing matters. Nothing's going to change. I can't do anything. Uh, you develop a lack of trust and even apathy. So we're not superheroes. And um, I have a really good example of this. Um, when I first started working with these kids and they left the program at 18, I would give them my phone number. And I would say to them, Call me. Call me if you run into trouble any time, day or night. You know, if you tell a teenager to call you when they're in trouble, they're going to call you. And uh, I, I like to take credit for the first hotline that was created because while I, I, while I recognized that, you know, this was a really valuable service, it couldn't be a one man it couldn't be a one-man show, right? So we developed a system of trading off that phone number or that phone at the time to make sure that everybody took turns and their needs were met. The serenity prayer, has anybody ever heard of this? Okay. Um, if you're an AA or NA, um, it makes a lot of sense whether you're an addict of some sort or not because when you think about the words, grant me the serenity to accept the things that I cannot change, there are things that you're not going to be able to change and you need to be able to accept that. And the courage to change the things that I can, having courage in, in the face of some of the traumas that you're going to experience, it's going to take a lot. Um, but I think the most important line is the wisdom to know the difference. Taking the time out, taking, taking just a, a few moments to, to take some deep breaths and recognize what you do have control of and what you don't. What does healthy self-care look like? Adequate sleep, healthy nutrition, physical activity, relaxation, and socializing. I can't tell you that you need eight hours of sleep. You may not be that kind of person, right? whatever works for you. If you're waking up in the morning so exhausted that it's hard for you to get, get to work or school in the morning, then you're not getting adequate sleep and it's eventually going to affect you. Healthy nutrition. What does that look like for a college student? Ramen noodles? <laughs> Sometimes without water, right? Not, not really a good idea. Not really a good idea, but you want to keep some healthy snacks going. Uh, and every couple of hours is really a good idea, and I know that doesn't happen either. Uh, relaxation, physical activity. For me, walking. When I get stressed out, my whole body hurts. But when I go for a walk, it's, it's like everything just relaxes. So walking might work. You might like a good workout, but you got to identify it for yourself. Relaxation, what does that look like? Does that look like Netflix um, marathon? Watching horror pictures and, and dramas? That are, is that making things any better? Uh, and socializing does not mean going to parties until 3 o'clock in the morning and then getting up for class at, at, at 6. So you need to monitor your reactions to others' pain. And you need to stop if you feel like you're absorbing too much. And you need to go to those identified coping skills. Identify your own triggers. Are you working with someone that is a little too close to home with your own experiences? Recognize the signs of what's going on within you. Learn to say no. And no doesn't have to be ugly right? For me, no says, that's a great idea. I love that you're thinking, but I'm not in a position to make that decision today. I'll get back to you. And then I eventually say no. And relationship is really good. When you develop a relationship with your kids, it's awesome. But I can't talk about relationships because that's a whole nother 20 minutes or more. Um, find a balance. Develop a routine. If you develop a routine and stick with it, 
it, it it's a great way to keep yourself consistent. Uh, you know, studies show that uh, 21 days creates a habit. Uh, well, when you're a caregiver, it's more like 21 weeks. And when you're dealing with your own traumas, it could be 21 months. Okay, so it's really important, no matter how tired you are, that you stick to that routine. Uh, don't let yourself get hangry. Has anybody ever been hangry? You can't think straight, right? You're grouchy, you're yelling at your client, and they don't even know why. Don't let yourself get hangry. Make sure you keep your healthy snacks in your desk. It's okay to share them with your clients once in a while, but make sure they're not too good because they'll end up coming back and making up excuses just to get those snacks. Accept support. Connect with an accountability buddy. Know who that person is ahead of time and let them know what your triggers are and let them know the type of help that you need. Regular check-in meetings. Uh, one of the things I established is a weekly meeting, whether it be with my peers or my managers or people working for me. It's really important to do a check-in every week because you can, you can support each other just by the look on somebody's face because you know the signs from working with them week after week. Attending networking and training, great way to get new ideas. Of course, you maintain confidentiality, but you always want to get new ideas from other players. Delegate responsibilities. This one was a hard one for me. I had to fix everything. So it's OK to delegate to someone, even if they're not going to do things exactly the way you're going to do it or you would have done it. Don't make big decisions. I can't tell you how many times I have witnessed, and even myself have done it, where you quit because you're frustrated over what's going on in your organization. And, you know, as a caregiver, you can probably get a, another job really quickly, only to find out that the same thing is going on in the other organization because they don't have magic, magic uh, powers to fix things as quickly as you would like them. The blame game, don't blame the company, don't blame the person, don't blame your peers. Complaining and commiserating with your coworkers, the worst thing you can do when you're in a negative state is complain to a coworker who can't do a darn thing about it. So you're contagious and you're poisoning the culture. Addictive behaviors, if you find yourself going home and, and the first thing you reach for is a bottle of wine, and you consume it and, and you just need to check out, that, that's a problem. So caregiver challenges, um, sh definitely shortage of staff uh, is very common. There's a very high turnover. Overwork and underpaid. Caregivers should probably be paid double what they're making in, in the world of child care, residential child care. Uh, negative culture and the one person fix. Okay, I can't be the one to fix everything. There's a difference between holding a, a client and even your staff accountable, uh, enabling them versus encouraging them to do better. Big difference. You can't take on the responsibility of doing all the research and doing all the phone calls and everything. You have to pass that responsibility on to the client. Okay, so when you have a negative culture, you tend to get stuck in that negative culture and, and you say, when we have enough staff, we'll do this. And when we have enough staff, we'll do that. And you come up with some really creative, positive ideas, but you, you keep waiting for that full staff that never happens. So uh, this is just a, a cutesy little program that we came up with to catch a kid doing something right. And whether your population is a kid or uh, another client, you can make up little games to encourage and celebrate the milestones. And what happened with this was we gave them, um, we created a resident of the week, a VIP lunch for anybody that didn't get any incident reports, uh, riddle of the day, if you could get the answer, we celebrated with you. Word of the week, we had staff that had nothing to do with direct care of, of the students 
actually stopping to say, hey, you know the word of the week? Well, uh, uh, let me tell you. And, and they were engaged. So what happened was we thought that the kids were going to develop a positive attitude towards succeeding in the program. But it also changed the mindset of the staff because what was happening with the staff was they were always looking for negatives. They were always talking about the problems, the problems. And by doing this, they were looking for successes and celebrating everything with them. And um, staff started sending me ideas on other programs to do with the kids. So uh, one of those no things sometimes came up, but I encouraged them because they were thinking. Um, so the, the last line is what I want to bring to your attention is that um, we were fully staffed in less than a year because staff started referring uh, people to them. Uh, to our organization, and there the incidents have gone down, and um, it's just a really great place to work. But you know what? Same problems still exist. We just found a positive way to address them, so you can do it. And I think, okay, what does a healthy boundary look like for you? Would you tell a client where you live? I never did, <laughs> but they found out where I lived because they knew what kind of car I drove. So be prepared. What, what are some examples of what, what you would consider a healthy boundary? Would you stay after 5 o'clock if your time was up at 5 to work with a client? Or would you delegate? There's all sorts of things as uh, caregivers that we cross boundaries and it ends up affecting our mental health. So that's it. I thought I was going to have a problem doing 20 minutes. <laughs> So we're going to spend about 10 minutes really quick before I give you all the closing information because I definitely want to share a lot of resources that we have and what's outside on the table. We're going to talk a little bit about myths and facts about sex trafficking. And I know a lot of our speakers have already alluded to it, um, but the newest thing that I've seen recently is there's a, a video of a woman given a hand sign uh, that she's being trafficked. Um, there's another one where t-shirts are being wrapped about, around windshield wipers. And so that's so to keep women outside or men outside from taking off the T-shirts and then they'll get abducted. So there's tons of these myths that we see portrayed um, mainly on social media. So what are some other, do y'all have any other myths that y'all have heard recently about sex trafficking? So you've heard that it's the result of the crisis at the border, okay? What about you? Oh, like the tissue in the door handle. That was actually laced with a drug, I believe. I saw that here in Houston. That was actually confirmed by law enforcement. Um, so I, I did see that one as well. So I'm going to throw it over to our panel to have a discussion, a little bit of a discussion about what y'all have just seen. And I know we've definitely seen the zip ties on the doors, um, sex trafficking at Katie Mills Mall. I've heard that a lot. I live in Fulcher not far from Vanessa. Um, and so we hear so much misinformation that it detracts from what the truth is. And so I will throw it over to the panel. Anybody that wants to just speak first. I mean, I have, I always have things to say. <laughs> I think um, a couple of just notes on this. One, I, I have this phrase I started using during the pandemic when we really saw a lot of this, um, survivors over social media. We need to be listening to people that have lived this over the people that are posting this in their neighborhoods. Um, and so if it's not coming from someone who's actually lived it, it's not worth sharing. Um, and I think what is so, uh, 
appealing in, in the negative sense of the word, but appealing about these stories is that it does produce a lot of fear. It produces this fear-based result that makes us feel like if I share this post that I'm doing something good or I can do something about this thing that I really have no control over. Because human trafficking is so separate from me and it would never happen to me or I just need to look at and be careful. Um, and when we view trafficking in that light, we really miss the opportunity to see how embedded and intertwined it is with our everyday lives and, and our culture and our communities and the people around us. And it's very easy to step back from kind of a relational responsibility that we have to our communities. And not that anyone is doing that intentionally, right? But it's it's the pull of these, of these crazy stories to think that it's so out there, this would never happen to me, but I, I, I can share about it. And then, and we, it's just, it's this like adrenaline rush, fear mongering kind of thing. Um, but I have worked with so many clients who don't believe they're trafficked because they weren't kidnapped. And to look a, a person in the eye and to hear the horrors of the abuse that they've experienced in their relationship, and it doesn't dawn on them that that was exploitation because it doesn't match what a local mother wanted to post on Facebook about creepers in the Target parking lot, that's very frustrating to me. Um, and it's damaging to the people that have lived it. And so please hear me, no shame. If you have read these stories, if you have shared them, it is from a good place, your heart is in the right place. Um, but it's one of those things where we kind of have to be a little bit louder than social media because social media is really loud. Um, and so I just want to say if if we're sharing stories, let it be a survivor's voice. Um, but I, I just think that's probably the safest bet. Thank you, Krista. Anybody else? She got it covered. <laughs> Sounds good. I have a few cards. I'm not going to read them all. Just wanted to um, throw a few of them out there. One of them is, are there any human trafficking bills we should be watching at the state or federal level? I actually don't want them to answer that because you have to come back Thursday to learn about that. Thursday is social justice and advocacy, and we're going to be covering all of the legislation. So are places like hotels mandatory reporters? They, it is mandatory they be trained as of House Bill 390. Year. Yes. But not, right. They're not mandated reporters, nope. Yeah. Okay. So let's see, one or two more. Can shelters provide support for victims of human trafficking? Krista says yes. And they. They often do. They often do. Um, shelters are one of maybe the first places where um, a survivor overcomer will go to in order to seek refuge. Absolutely. And a lot of times they're in, they're very much living in the moment, right? So they had, they were abused by their trafficker who they might not view as a trafficker and they run away, they don't have a place to go, they get into a shelter. Um, and that's why it's so important that staff and we're be trained and that we're trained um, in a very multidisciplinary way because these people that are experiencing trafficking are going to intersect with other services that are not trafficking specific. And so having nurses, doctors, dentists, hotel staff, anybody that might engage with these people be trained is really important. So a question online was, how is Operation Lone Star contributing to human trafficking? I don't know what Operation Lone Star is. Does anybody else? Do you all know? Mm -mm. Okay, okay. Well, we will definitely, if, if you have questions out there that were not answered, we will make sure that we answer them on the live feed or we'll make sure that you have access to them when they are over. So for the panel, is there anything else that y'all want to share? You've, we've heard the whole night's events, everything we've discussed. Is there something that wasn't covered that you want, just want to close out the, show, close out the evening with? 
Yeah, I would, I would just jump in. Um, I, I can't leave without saying that, you know, a lot of times we're, we're here for human trafficking, right? We're here to learn about human trafficking. And um, we sort of see human trafficking as the wound, right? And it's like, oh, we need to put a Band-Aid over that wound right there. But I think that in order to really understand human trafficking, we have to understand it from a holistic view and a holistic perspective. So what are some of the root causes of human trafficking? There's so much that we can cover. Um, if you can go to the state website, um, the United States Human Trafficking Advisory Council put out an annual report and suggests some of the ways that you can really support individuals of human trafficking and then some of the ways that you can support providers who are in this field of anti-trafficking. So again, just looking at it from a holistic view, Yes, we're talking about human trafficking, but you know, like as I mentioned, it targets vulnerabilities. What are some of the vulnerabilities? Well, we need to be addressing poverty. So, like, if you're working and addressing poverty, you are fighting human trafficking. If you're addressing hunger, you're fighting human trafficker. If you're addressing racism, you're fighting trafficking. So, it's a holistic view of um, how we can combat trafficking. So, I just don't want you to look at the band-aid itself. Okay, does anybody else want to add to that? So Dr. Goins has asked, how, do, how does a regular person go about shutting down an illicit massage parlor? And that is demand disruption. Uh, demand disruptions work. Vanessa kind of alluded to it. In Fort Bend County for the past, I don't know, two years, I've been working through, going through our more populous cities and enacting city ordinances to curb them from being able to open from the beginning. That's considered phase one. You really have to have coverage of these change of ordinances because if not what's going to happen they close down and they just pop up somewhere else they're notorious for popping back up so once you cover that was my goal was to cover fort Bend county and these new city ordinances and then after that remember they talked about how to shut down a brothel and so um, i will pitch that over i know uh, we can talk to vanessa and fong about how to actually shut down a brothel it is a detailed process that demand disruption has um, and we will get that information out to y'all. So you cannot leave one of these events hearing all of this and find out what can you do. And so we know that trafficking victims are in our communities and they are hidden in plain sight. You have to learn the signs, educate yourself and your community, spread the word and know where to report. You report these crimes to the National Human Trafficking Hotline. That number is 1-888-373-7888. If you believe that victim is under the age of 18, the report is actually to DFPS. Um, first of all, if you see something and it looks like a very dangerous situation, 911 is your first option. That QR code, just take a picture of it. Don't try to scan it so that you can take it home. That is a list of human trafficking books that I have read and reread and it covers a litany of topics. And so we talk about do something. How do we do something? Over the course of the next three days, you're going to be seeing 15 to 20 different organizations. I urge each and every one of you in attendance here and virtually, look up all of these organizations. Look them up by their website address and find something that you want to engage with. There is enough work for all of us to do. I do believe, I'm a firm believer, that if we all individually find something that we can do, collectively we can move mountains. So tonight in, this, in the Human Trafficking QR Code book, there is a book in there and it's called When Silence Ends. Um, and we have a giveaway tonight. Um, and so I need to know, like today is October 18th, who has the closest birthday? October 12th, okay. October 19th. So let me tell you, y'all too, I will give both of you. Oh, oh, sorry. Okay, so who else is closer to October 18th? We need one more person. October 28th, okay, so. So let me tell you a little bit about this book. When Silence Ends was written by Hands of Justice. They're gonna be here tomorrow night. It showcases 19 different forms of sex trafficking. 
and it not it took the stories of 19 survivors and it gave those stories to artists and those artists drew photographs drew images and artwork to go along with the story the book also gives facts statistics you're going to find a reference at the end of the book with tons of information i love reference lists that's where you just go into that deep dive rabbit hole and research so this book is an amazing book to share to understand the complexities and the diversity of sex trafficking this image right here is in the book and my story is in the book as a survivor as well and so we're going to give these two books out to two people and then we're going to have two people online too as well So we would love to have your feedback on tonight's presentation. We did give you a QR code for a survey. If you could please complete that. Tomorrow evening, we will be covering the needs of survivors. And so you're going to be hearing from groups that work with child victims, adult victims, incarcerated survivors, um, and also law enforcement on how to prosecute trafficking. We're going to end with a survivor panel. There's going to be three women on that survivor panel to speak, so you don't want to miss it. As you're heading out the door, like any good social worker, there is a resource table. And there is amazing resources on that table. So pick one up of everything. You can put it in your resource folder. Um, and with that, I hopefully will see some of y'all tomorrow. And so good evening. <laughs>